Good day and welcome to this Global Leaders for Parity event. Bonjour, je suis Caroline Cotzi, présidente fondatrice de la gouvernance au féminin. Et c'est un immense plaisir pour moi aujourd'hui d'accueillir nos euh, panélistes distingués que je vais vous présenter dans un instant. So for the format of the event today, we will be speaking English primarily. Uh, we do have some Toronto-based panelists. And for the Q&A period, please feel free to ask your questions in either French or English. Donc, pour la période questions-réponses, s'il vous plaît, ne vous gênez pas en français ou en anglais. Alors, je vais commencer par vous présenter uh, nos panélistes. Uh, Annick Trudel is the CEO of Lavery Avocat, uh, Lavery Lawyers. Uh, Jennifer Bishop is a business law partner at Miller Thompson. And Solomon Sananis is a managing partner at Norton Rose Fulbright uh, here in Montreal. Uh, the Q&A period will be moderated by Sunita Mahant. Sunita is Senior Director of Legal Affairs at Ivanhoe Cambridge. She also co-chairs our Toronto Volunteer Volunteers Committee and has been involved with women in governance for quite a number of years now. So thank you, uh, dear panelists, for being here today. Uh, we will be discussing the topic of closing the gender gap in the workplace in the legal industry. So it's quite a big topic. We've got 45 minutes to talk amongst ourselves uh, uh, until uh, 12.45 at which time Sunita will be asking questions from the audience. We've got a few hundred people uh, watching us. We will be recording this. So if uh, there's anyone that uh, uh, you or people in the audience would like to send the, um, the, the tape uh, after, we'll be happy to share that with everyone. So I'll begin with the very first question, which is geared towards the entire uh, group, the three uh, panelists. Uh, so despite the fact that uh, female country leaders have demonstrated their capacity to manage COVID, the COVID crisis brilliantly. I mean, we've seen it in Taiwan, we've seen it in Germany, we've seen it in several uh, uh, Northern countries. Uh, there, there's been at the same time, a surprisingly large number of women who have lost their jobs. So we're talking about a female recession. There was a lot of talk about women wanting to take time off, uh, just even if they have a job because they have children to take care of. So all of this going on at the same time, this new reality for both women and men, um, how do you think that organizations can still reap the benefits of their organization's success equally? How can we still give a chance to women at every level of the organizations. Anik, would you like to begin? Sure, absolutely. First of all, thanks for the invitation, oh, uh, Caroline. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not an easy question you're actually raising, uh, and it's complex, and, and I think there's many layers to it. Uh, obviously, when I, when I look at the studies and, and I look at the reality, both in Quebec or elsewhere, uh, I do realize that, that women, actually, there's, there's a recent study from uh, the Boston group that, that said that there's about 15 hours uh, of, of, of extra time that that women are taking from home to manage kids etc and, and obviously that ha I mean even though the dynamics right now involve both men and women uh, it's an issue and I, I think there's you know there's not a one-size-fits-all answer to 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 your question I think it starts by being very open and to listen uh, and actually ensuring that there's a dialogue because it, what I'm noticing is that every single situation is unique uh, you know, you've got single mothers, you've got uh, mothers that have help at home, you've got, uh, uh, you know, obviously we've got female partners who are, who are single. Uh, so every situation is very different. Uh, and, and I think we need to, two things, so enter into a dialogue uh, to really understand everybody's reality. And also on the other side is not to be shy to actually talk about the issues in this new reality uh, and, and to put it on the table and actually to force the dialogue. So it, I think there's a mutual obligation here on, on the part of the managers, but also on the part of the female partners and the associates. Um, I, I'm interested to, to know what, you know, uh, what my other colleagues think about that. But for me, there's no one size fits all. And, and it's really diving into your own reality, which is very different from one person to the other. Right, Jennifer, what are your thoughts? 
I agree completely. I think acknowledging that the issue exists is yes. the most critical piece and having the conversation um, and, and absolutely ensure that there's dialogue and not making any assumptions that um, you know, providing extra childcare might be the answer because there are all kinds of unintended consequences that are happening as a result of this increase in domestic violence. There's all sorts of, of, of examples. Um, you know, and I think that um, it's, it's really critical for the management and decision makers of the firm to involve women in these conversations in their crisis management. So um, have 50% of the people at the table be women uh, so that all of these uncomfortable conversations can be thrown out there, because I think that is the only way that we're going to be able to move the needle and truly address this. Um, and, you know, I think special attention also needs to be given to the fact that um, everybody is in the same boat, um, you know, uh, uh, um, and at the end of the day, our clients are also suffering and uh, for organizations to perhaps just give their people comfort that it's okay and acknowledge that everybody is doing their best and we're going to get through this and let's figure out the best way to do it together is really, really critical. Right, and Jennifer, you're raising an important point. I find that too often we make decisions for women without consulting them. Um, and things like, for instance, thinking that a woman who came back from maternity leave will not want this promotion because she's got enough to, to handle uh, without even actually asking her first. Uh, Solomon, what are your thoughts? Oh, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Caroline, for the invitation to participate in this, in this seminar. Uh, I, I completely agree with the comments both Jennifer and Anik made, uh, very, very uh, uh, important points. Uh, one thing I would add to that, though, is it seems to me that we shouldn't let uh, the lessons learned from the pandemic go to waste. We should take the, uh, the opportunity to learn uh, what we've gone through in the past, uh, past four months and will continue to go through, unfortunately, for another several months. Uh, most specifically, I think that uh, what we've lived through and continue to live through uh, really presents an interesting opportunity uh, to, to normalize remote working, to normalize flexible work arrangements, to show that you know it's absolutely workable and fine, be it for men or women or, or you know whoever. Um, so I think that that's the kind of thing that we certainly, as a firm, are learning, uh, and the uh, the experience of the pandemic uh, has caused us to certainly accelerate uh, our views with respect to uh, uh, normalizing uh, remote working and much more flexible work arrangements, etc. Right, so a lot of people are finding that this is in favor of women, that a lot of women who in the past were shy to go back into the workforce now have this flexibility. Uh, the issue here, though, when you think of it, is that with children at home, it is still the women who primarily take care of the children, even if both are working full time. Uh, women are still taking probably double the toll that, that men are taking both with the housework and, uh, and with the children. So we'll have to see if this is a plus or a minus uh, for women. But, uh, if I just build on that, uh, Kathleen, because you make a very good point. Uh, I mean, no crystal balls, obviously, but who knows, maybe again, with a lesson to learn from this experience and both men and women working from home, maybe that'll give an opportunity for men to take more of a role in terms of the work at home and uh, you know, sharing more equally the tasks that uh, have historically, you're absolutely right, uh, been more, uh, been more uh, undertaken by, uh, by women. Right, and I find we're being collectively very positive about everything that we're living through. And um, hopefully, uh, as you said, men will, will, will see what it means to have to take care of both your job and your children. Uh, but there was a, um, I can't remember if it was Forbes or Fortune article that was talking about the younger generation and saying good news, uh, the young fathers are now uh, taking care of their children uh, much more than they used to, almost as much as the young mothers, but they're still not doing the dishes. So there's uh, still a part, of, <laughs> a part of the role that hasn't been taken on uh, by men. Jennifer, did you want to jump in? 
I just wanted to make one point to build off of, um, of Solomon's comment. You know, it, it, it's also an opportunity when you talk about lessons learned to do a deep dive into policies. And when we talk about normalizing, we talk about maternity and paternity leave. Um, let's not allow paternity leave to be taboo. Let's now make it something that we encourage our young men to take because that then has the additional effect of supporting the women in the home. Yeah. Well, that's actually great. Uh, go ahead, Annick. Well, if, if I may add, I mean, obviously it's, it's, uh, it's an equality issue at this point. And, and I think men and women are, are, you know, living through a pretty similar situation and, and really for all industries, but I think it's particularly true for the legal industry. It, it, this this COVID pandemic is really forcing us to review our business model, and it really goes to the core of of how like our identity uh, and the way we've been functioning for 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 years. Um, and I think that the whole career pathing is also at the center of this you know this new conversation. And uh, you know we've we've been reviewing our business model for at least three you know three years. And I think the pandemic in that respect is, is a great opportunity to, to actually move forward with different career paths uh, and, and having a different mindset with respect to the professional perspective. And uh, I, I, you know, there, as I said, there's no quick answer to that because there's all kinds of consequences. There's all kinds of compromises both, mm -hmm. you know, everybody needs to do. But I think it's a very interesting time for the legal industry at this point. Yeah, and probably, you know, when I look at um, what young female lawyers who are predominant, uh, and my, my daughter is a lawyer, uh, as you know, Anik, and when yeah. she did the bar, um, there were only four boys in her classroom. So definitely, I think law firms are going to have to rethink a lot of their models in terms of what it takes to progress, because although there are so many young girls graduating and entering the workforce within your respective organizations, when we look at the top of the house, uh, too often it's still highly male dominated. Um, so we're, we're fortunate to have your three organizations that we're all involved in the uh, parity certification and making sure that your policies, as Jennifer was mentioning, you know, you need to relook at your policy and, and what is it that organizations are putting in place. But then there's also a culture shift that needs to take place because even if you put, you know, you, you develop a policy for men to take time off to take care of their kids, but they don't do it because they're concerned that they'll be frowned upon or that that will limit their career movements. Um, you know, it's, 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 there's several steps to be taken before we can, we can say we're achieving success. I'd love to hear your perspectives. Um, Annick Lavrie has been involved as the first law firm since her fourth year already involved in the parity certification. Uh, Solomon uh, with Norton Rose, you joined in 2018, so it's your third year and you've made it all the way to platinum level, which is quite uh, rare for, for a law firm. We, uh, other organizations, there's eight uh, platinum level organizations. Uh, Jennifer Miller-Thompson has done it in the past, is actually looking into coming back because it is a continuous process. You can't just do it once, look at what is going on and just stop. It's every year you need to measure, you need to progress. So I'd be happy to hear your thoughts on what organizations can do to concretely uh, move the needle. What you've done in the past, what your experience has been, and what you foresee for the future. Annie, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Um, for me uh, and, and from our perspective, so we were um, really involved at the outset in the certification. And actually there's two things that, that occurred. First of all, uh, you know, the, the first lesson was we're not perfect uh, and it's okay uh, because it's a process, it's a journey. It's, it's you know, it's as you, you said, it, it's, it's something that you need to work on for uh, a sustainable period of time. Um, and, and it's, it's also triggering the awareness because I don't think we, you can change unless you have a high level of, of awareness of where you're at and, and to set some goals also as to where you want to be. And, uh, I, you know, when we started the certification, we were at, at the, you know, our results were, were okay, but you know, not impressive. So 
we really had to kind of focus on, okay, mm -hmm. where are the issues? What are the root cause? And, and where do we want to go? And we have 66% of our professional workforce, which are women. So that's a lot. And at, at when we started, uh, there was 25% of partnership, female partnership, which in the industry is, is still not bad. Uh, but now we're at, you know, we moved the needle to 30. Uh, and actually in the last three years, uh, and I, I was looking at the statistics and I was, uh, so, for the last three years, we've appointed, you know, 60%, 75%, 80% of our uh, partners uh, were female. So I, I think there's to be conscious of the promotion you want to do within your firm and also to make sure that there's, um, I, I'm looking in, in the industry, uh, the most recent statistics of uh, the Quebec bar is that there's only 18% of managing partners, which are females, uh, and very few uh, practice group leaders, uh, 26%. So once again, I think you need to set some goals. You need to go out there and make sure you, uh, you look at who's interested uh, and, and who has the talent. You have to grow your talent. There's a lot of training uh, related to that too. And also it has to be part of the career planning. So you can't just, you need to take people by the hand and plan things out with them. So uh, for, for us, the certification has really been an eye opener and a great way to, to you know, to, to set our goals very clearly and to be aware, even when we uh, define, you know, committee members, uh, uh, board members, uh, to have always in mind that uh, that to making sure that parity is uh, is a priority is always top of mind, and definitely uh, having a female CEO at, at your firm, I think, gives a lot of ambition to younger women uh, at lower levels to see that you know, well, as we say, if she can see it, she can be it. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because I think it has a lot to do with culture. You know, it boils down to culture, mm -hmm. uh, and and the word culture has never necessarily been something that's. Uh, I think in the last ten years, it's been a word that's been part of the vocabulary of law firms, but it's been took a long time before we actually became like corporations where the notion of culture, internal culture, is important. And uh, when you're, you know, I think at Lavery, the big difference is we have a, a culture of openness. And that's in like, like the long history of the firm, LGBT, like we've always been very open. Uh, and, and when you're more open in culture, well, you're less resistant to change. And that's, but that's something you have to work at. And, and we have multiple generations, you know, we have like six group of generations in our firm and every generation carries its own perception and its own uh, notion of identity as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge. And an important point you were making is about the, uh, is about progress, not perfection. We're not looking for perfection. Nobody's perfect. And we've had organizations in the past saying, Oh no, 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 we can't do the certification now because we've got some work to do first. <laughs> and it's the exact opposite. It's, this is where you begin. Uh, this is how, you know, you get uh, support to, to actually know where your uh, gaps are and what you need to focus on. Everybody wants more diversity. Everybody wants more women. Everybody wants, you know, uh, to, to allow uh, women to get to decision-making bodies. But if you don't measure, if you don't take the time to look at where your gaps are and what their root cause is, it's going to be very difficult to actually work on them. And, and, and action them. Uh, what are your thoughts, Solomon? Well, it's interesting, uh, you know, Carolina, you make the point uh, that it's a continuing uh, process. Uh, you know, even though you know, we're very happy, obviously, to be uh, platinum certified and we're very proud of that, uh, we certainly don't say, okay, great, job well done, and uh, we're done. We can now move on to something else. That's absolutely not the case. Uh, and quite frankly, I think that, uh, you know, as the years pass, I think the platinum of today. Uh, hopefully, it'll be uh, you know the bronze of tomorrow, and then we'll be looking at many different, uh, many different and uh, meaningful uh, objectives that we'll have to to put in place. Um, I find that uh, a lot of firms, including our own, uh, historically, I've spent a lot of time looking at numerical targets and you know the number of female partners, the number of other minorities in the partnership. Uh, 
what, what we've tried to do and some of the things that uh, I would say the, the uh, assessment tool has allowed us to at least reflect on is what other things we should do beyond just the numbers, what concrete uh, objectives we should put in place, what, what uh, kind of thinking we should do. And when we look at parity, uh, it's not just parity in terms of numbers. Uh, we look at parity in terms of making sure there's fair work allocation uh, amongst, uh, you know, male and female, uh, uh, young and middle level and senior associates and more junior partners, parity in terms of uh, client relationships and opportunities to go and develop those client relationships, uh, parity in terms of community profile is very important. And, and also, of course, and you highlighted it uh, very well, uh, Anik and uh, Caroline, uh, you know, parity in terms of the internal roles that we have, management roles, et cetera. But, I mean, we really need to look at this collectively, uh, you know, at all the different levels and all the kinds of things we can do. And I think you hit it right on the head as well, uh, Caroline and Anik. It's really part of the, the culture. It just has to be the way of thinking. Uh, it can't just be about putting in place plans and programs and saying, okay, look how great we are. Now we have a uh, agile workplace policy, which we have as a, you know, every other firm has. It can't just be about that. It has to be much more about the, uh, you know, the whole ecosystem of the firm, and quite frankly, uh, the 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 industry. Not just uh, mm -hmm. and by industry, I don't mean just the legal industry. I mean all the participants in, uh, you know, the transactional industry, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, we we are very grateful that we've got uh, uh, law firms as part of the uh, of our certification ecosystem because at the end of the day, there are. Uh, there are fields where it seems to be a little bit more challenging and probably the legal one. Um, and even, I guess, accounting must be the same uh, with the, uh, you know, the, the big uh, accounting firms. It's, it's, it's quite a challenge to be a woman and to thrive in, in these environments with billable hours. And there's, there's a number of, uh, you know, also what I've, I've been told a lot from women as well is the whole business development component, which is a little bit uh, harder uh, for, well, harder for women. Some women perceive that it's harder for them. I find it fascinating because in reality, women are actually probably better negotiators than men when it doesn't come to their own uh, salary or their own conditions. And when they're talking uh, in the name of a group or in the name of a cause or in the name of someone that they're defending. So uh, it's, uh, I, 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 I keep thinking that women at uh, more, uh, in more negotiation tables really have to have their space because then we would reduce that big time. You're, you're and right. Uh, and sorry, and that's just very quick. That's why I refer to this transactional ecosystem because it's not just the lawyers and yeah. law firm. It's yeah. also the clients. It's also, you know, all exactly. the, the bankers, et cetera, the M&A advisors. We're all part of that, that, that ecosystem that yeah. has to evolve. Exactly. Uh, Jennifer? Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to to um, continue on the lines of the the client comment because they're not only um, expecting it of us now, they're demanding it, and it's much more than the faces that you can put in a glossy RFP response. You know, they they are actually holding firms accountable now. Um, you know, is the trial being run by a woman? How many billable hours on uh, on an account? Um, are, are taken up by women? How many women leaders do we have on the file? Um, so it's really progressed to the point where um, we're being called out on it and rightfully so. And, um, you, know, we, um, you know, we also as a firm, one of the benefits to us re-engaging, and I'm really, really thrilled that we are, we talked about data and, um, you know, one of our biggest personal learnings, there was a small group that got together to really get beyond the how many female equity partners do we have? How many male equity partners do we have? And we broke it down by group. We broke it down by region. We broke it down by age. Um, you know, we might look at our, I'm making this up, our litig litigation group, and we have 20 female partners and 24 male partners, and we think that's great. But if we haven't made a female a partner in the last 15 years in the litigation group, then we have to look at that gap, right? So. So, you know, or in the business law group, we see we have 12 senior women, but when you drill down, well, five of them are associate counsel, some of them are still income partners, and we only have two uh, equity partners, neither of whom are in leadership positions, and why is that? So um, it's really been eye-opening for us, and of course, now the next step will be 
How do we hold ourselves accountable for acknowledging those gaps? Very important indeed. Um, we've spoken about the fact that, you know, working from home keeps some of our um, some of our staff away from maybe informal mentoring. And we may have spoken about this before we actually started the Zoom, uh, in case people are wondering. Um, I think it's important to make sure that we don't forget the younger generation that is not privy to certain leadership conversations that they would that used to catch in the corridors. So I'm sure you're all involved in, in mentoring in, in some capacity. Anik actually is involved uh, at the Women in Governance Mentoring Program. Um, Jennifer, I know you chair the board of Tennis Canada. I'm sure you, you play a role uh, in, in mentoring uh, either around there or within your own organization and Solomon as well. What do you tell young women who are right now in this situation where they're looking at advancing their careers, but have sort of these added obstacles, which is all the online and the Zooms and the not rubbing shoulders with, uh, with their colleagues anymore. Do you want to begin, Yannick? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I, I think that, uh, you know, mentoring and it's very important in any organization to, to have some form of sponsorship and, and somebody who has your back. Uh, and, and somebody as well who will just say it as it is, you know, no sugar coating uh, and, and, and to push you. Um, and once again, there's no, uh, you know, there's no magic uh, bullet here and, and every circumstance is different because every woman is, is at a different stage, has a different circumstance. Um, and, and I think that, you know, my first the first, uh, uh, you know, tip I always kind of abide by is authenticity uh, and, and to be real, you know, and, and put the things that bother you on the table, uh, not go into like a passive aggressive, uh, you know, mode and, and just, you know, reach out because if you don't reach out and you're kind of waiting for people to reach out to you, uh, usually the result is certainly not as immediate as, as, uh, as you want, would want to. So I think it really always starts by, uh, by, by being present to how you feel, what's going on, what are your preoccupations, being able to have some form of support system. And as a firm, you need to provide that support system. But as an associate or as a partner, you need to tap into it. Uh, so for me, it's always obligation uh, réciproque, as we, as I would say in French. Um, so, so that for me is always kind of the, the 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 starting point. Be authentic about what's going on. Put things on the table and come with solutions. Um, you know, I'm I'm pretty harsh on that. For me, you know, if you got a problem, then there is a solution. So don't bring me the problem. Bring let's have a conversation around how we're going to fix the problem. Um, yeah. So, you know, that would be. Yeah, I couldn't agree with. more. What we always tell our, our mentors is uh, avoid solution pollution. So, <laughs> if the mentor is spending 12 months with their mentee telling them what to do, then what's yeah. going to happen in 12 months, right? So, push them to find their own solutions and to have the right mindset and way of thinking that will bring them their, uh, their answers. Yeah. Jennifer, what about you? Yeah. Yes, Anik. Well, the solution doesn't need to be perfect. You know, it, and it sometimes the solution is not realistic, but it doesn't really matter because it's it's the process, you know, to bring the person to think uh, about outside of their own box and and not be in a, in a waiting room. Sorry, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I would agree completely with that. I mean, you know, one of my early mentors told me um, that you have to be responsible for your own career, and this was 20 years ago, and I think it exists even more critically today because a lot of the larger law firms have HR folks who are checking in on the associates. They have formal mentoring programs where mentors are designated. And I, and I, and I, I encourage these young women to not rely. Even It's a resource. It's a source for you. It's an opportunity for you to learn and to grow and to use your voice, but don't rely on that for your success. Um, you know, we are expected to be good at so many things in the legal profession. You have to be an excellent lawyer. You have to look the part. You have to sound the part. You have to bring in business. You have to know how to mentor. You have to know how to manage. And you're not going to get those things from necessarily 
the mentor that the firm designates to you. Um, so, you know, I believe one of my most meaningful pieces of advice to these young women um, is to build your network. Look at people that you envy. I really liked how this person managed this issue with the staff. I really admired how this person sold his partner uh, on a business development opportunity. Um, and take all of those bits and sort of come up with what your uh, world is going to look like as you progress in the legal profession. And, you know, I also think that we're in a really exciting time for young people with, you know, Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement. Um, you know, women have a voice and they are growing in strength and power. And I encourage them to use it. The put your head down and get your work done and sneak it at the end of the day. Uh -uh. You have an opportunity now to affect change just as much as I might as a senior woman at the firm. Well, that's a great point, Jennifer. I love the fact that you, you know, we're mentioning you can go to different people for different reasons. And when I'm asked, do you have a mentor or have you had a mentor in your life? I always say I've had an advisory committee. And I go to different people for different reasons. And uh, this is, to me, the most efficient way. I know exactly what I need and how, how to get it. So, And if you're generous with your time and with your actions, et cetera, people will be generous back. Even if you're not being generous towards that person, I think people usually know the kind of person you are and, and will just want to help you. Uh, Solomon, how about you? Uh, well, I com agree completely with Jennifer and Anik's uh, comments in terms of the uh, uh, the importance of mentoring, and uh, you know the discussion about the the uh, uh, perspective of the mentee. Uh, I guess what I can add to the discussion, perhaps, is from the perspective of the mentor. What's very important, mm -hmm. uh, at least at our firm, is you know educating the mentor, making them aware of the kinds of challenges. Uh, that, uh, that 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 uh, some of the younger people are facing, uh, be it uh, you know unconscious bias, etc. Uh, because a lot of times, uh, again, I guess necessarily for an unconscious bias, uh, the, the the mentors aren't necessarily sufficiently aware of some of the issues that are being faced by uh, some of our younger uh, colleagues, the females in particular. So for us, that educational and awareness role. Uh, for the mentor is very, very important. And we, we, we in the past few years, have been certainly uh, uh, investing a lot in that area. Do, do you think, Solomon, that young men maybe are more, uh, more often sponsored than young women? Uh, you know, uh, I don't think so. But going back to the comment I made before about the kinds of sponsorship and the different things that young lawyers are expected to do, uh, you know, as, as Jennifer very uh, uh, very well explained, uh, I do sometimes still see situations where different opportunities are presented to different people, right. and that's something that we really need to uh, to work on. Uh, right, there was a and that's time when I'm aware of it and being at least sensitive to it, and saying, "Oh, you're right." Uh, you know, I'm taking Joe to meet the client, and I'm asking Jill to mm -hmm. you know do this fantastic uh, due diligence report. And so what a great job Jill did, and Joe, come with me to the client. So that's yeah. the kind of thing that we need to really uh, work on. I would also yeah, just add I, one thing. I, I think it's so, um, the other critical piece of this is for um, the younger women to um, acknowledge it exists. Unconscious bias and barriers exist. And um, uh, be aware of them. Um, skate with your head up, as they say. And, um, and, and recognize that all of this is not going to change in the now. It's not going to change in your timeline. It may not change before you reach, part, reach partnership or if you're a partner by the time you get to the management committee. Um, so find creative ways to, to build. And, and that sort of comes back to my original point. When you have a wider network, as opposed to aligning yourself with a couple of people, you're less likely to end up creating barriers for yourself. But I think acknowledging it exists and being aware of it and where it's coming from is a really, really critical piece to this. It, and it's not clear from the two of you, from, from Anique and from yourself, uh, as women who've made it to important roles in important firms, uh, the potential added obstacles that you may have had to face that Solomon may not have had to face 
Wow, that's a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> that's a different I, I, five I, minutes. <laughs> I can sign off if you want for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good idea. Um, actually, there, there's there's a few things that come to mind. Just to add to this last question, and I'll answer that one afterwards. But um, you know, I I think uh, the legal world has always been very focused on and devoted. Your time is devoted to clients. And your time is not traditionally devoted to training and learning, you know, having better EQ. Uh, so, so there's a cultural shift uh, that's been going on for several years. But, but before we actually get it right, uh, there's a huge investment of time that, that is required uh, in training people. So, you know, you can raise your hand and say, I want to be a mentor, but that does not necessarily make you a good mentor. Uh, you know, you have uh, uh, the first step, which is the desire to mentor, but, you know, there's all kinds of tools that you, that you need to provide these people with. So, and the other thing is, it's all about courage and taking risks as well, because to deconstruct perceptions, you actually need to have the guts and the courage to put it on the table and to deconstruct your perception of the perception of the person in front of you and ask the person in front of you to put him or herself into your shoes to actually shift, uh, you know, shift trade places. And uh, so, so the courage part is, 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 is really key. And I mean, obviously there's a generational issue here. So obviously when I started practicing and we're talking about 30 years ago, it was not at all the same environment than today. So obviously I went through all kinds of obstacles that, you know, fortunately enough, most women don't need to go through today. Uh, and I would say that what actually allowed me to go through, uh, to go through this uh, is, is the courage part and, and taking the risk to have a voice because what you realize is, you know, sometimes the door's going to shut, but most of the time people will have like a ha ha moment, especially today, because now, you know, men, uh understand that they need to listen that they need to be more uh aware and and be more sensitive uh so i think the reception is is much greater today than than it was 20 or 25 years ago um and that'll be my question to Solomon just after Jennifer uh, talks about her own obstacles. Uh, my question to, to you, Solomon, so we're keeping you here, uh, will be about uh, what the role of men is in uh, attaining gender equality. But let's hear it from uh, Jennifer. Sure. Um, you know, I have lots of specific examples that have cropped up both in my legal career and, you know, in, in my world of sitting on boards and in sharing Tennis Canada. Um, I would say a few of the common themes would be, um, you know, a committee is being created, I don't know, call it a partnership committee, a new partnership committee, the firm's being created to determine uh, who we're going to admit into partnership. And, you know, in a committee of 10, there's two women, and that's good enough. Um, right? We've got Jennifer, we've got Anik on the committee, so we check that box. Um, so sort of being satisfied that just one or two women present on a committee, a decision-making committee, a, a key management committee is enough uh, when it's not. Um, I would say some other examples um, would be assumptions that, um, that, that women with children are not available. So, you know, my daughter's 14 now, but certainly when she was younger, um, you know, I, I would be, um, by way of example, and it's not specific to me, you would be passed up on an opportunity, you're not even be given the opportunity because the assumption is you have a young child at home, so you're not going to want to um, go to this conference in New York, or you're not going to want to go on secondment at this client's office outside the city. So um, I would say those are sort of the common themes. And then there's the classic, you know, business development where, you know, um, uh, oops, we didn't realize the entire in-house legal team at this clan are women. We need to bring in some women, um, you know, and, and, you know, it, it just, it happens. And, uh, and, and, and honestly, it's, uh, it's about continuing to create awareness. And I now um, am in the fortunate position where I use my voice and I can say, I'll do it for you this time. But next time, if I'm not there from day one, you're going to have to sort it out yourself. So, um, you know, I, I still sense that there's some movement to be made there, um, but definitely more awareness is being brought to these issues. 
Do we still see senior partners, male senior partners going fishing together, going golfing together, doing activities that may put women aside? <laughs> We're assuming that the women don't want to fish or golf. Yeah. No, I agree. But technically, more often, you know. Yeah, but in all fairness, Caroline, women have their own activity. Women have their own activities as well now. You know that there's a whole woman network that did not exist before that is existing today that is excluding men as well. So we're we're kind of diving into the same kind of dynamics uh, on our side. So of course there's still you know male all male activities, but yeah, I don't necessarily have an issue with that. As long as you know when you're at the table, you're treated for equally, uh, because it's okay to to kind of work your network in different fashions. Uh, anyway, right, I, can't, I can't wait to hear Solomon on this. Issue. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, I neither fish nor golf, so I'm not crazy about those activities myself. Uh, the only concern I have is that there are. It seems to me that there are such tight ties that can you know be formed during these well i'm not going to call them retreats but whatever you you would like to call them that you know the informal time spent together on a golf course or you know fishing for a weekend that 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 means a lot that can help careers can't it wow. Solomon? Uh, i mean absolutely and that, that goes back to what i was saying before about the uh, you know, sort of the parody at all at all levels I guess uh, I was interested to hear Anik's uh, comments because uh, I find some of those activities a little bit more problematic than, than Anik seems to, I guess. Uh, and it goes back to what we were saying again before about, you know, having those client opportunities, having those uh, 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 opportunities to be involved in the community, et cetera. Um, and, and Anik's absolutely right. I mean, there are many, many more, um, uh, you know, women in business kinds of organizations, women in law, etc. Uh, and the other thing we're seeing a lot more of as well is at least that awareness so that when there are these activities, at least people will ask themselves the question, is this, you know, an appropriate kind of activity to engage in? Should we engage uh, women, as Jennifer was saying, to see, well, maybe you want to come fishing or maybe instead of fishing, we'll have a tennis tournament together and that we can at least have that conversation. Uh, as opposed to just assuming, you know, we'll go out and have cigars uh, after uh, after our uh, whiskey uh, competition or something. Um, so at least there's there's that awareness that there wasn't 15, 20, 25 years ago, and I think that's a positive step. Uh, but but things are, I mean, uh, like uh, like uh, I think you know, I've been here 25, 30 years, and the progress has there has been progress, absolutely. But it has certainly not been at warp speed. It's been very, very slow and uh, sometimes steady, sometimes less steady. But there's been progress. Yeah, I so, mean, in a, it, it, you know, I, I came back to the legal profession after going out of it for almost 15 years, and I was in a bit of state of shock. Uh, the, you know, when I started, especially when I got into CEO panels, and I realized, wow, like you know, we're still not, we're still totally outnumbered. Um, and there is absolutely still this concept of the boys club. And, you know, and, and the fact is that, uh, you know, the, 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 the generation who are like in their 40s, well, they were, quote unquote, you know, brought into the profession by older generations. So, you know, we're still fighting that. But um, I, I think that the level of awareness is much, uh, you know, is, is at another level. And I think with, you know, what's going on from a social standpoint and environment, uh, it forces the industry to, um, to be much more on its toes than, than, you know, when I left in 2006. So uh, and I like to look at the glass half full rather than half empty, but there's still obviously a lot of work to be done. I'm, I'm not uh, underestimating the amount of work. And Solomon, you've been humble uh, in the way you answered my question about men's role, because I did hear through some of your colleagues that you're very vocal on the importance of uh, a gender equality. Uh, so as a man, uh, cha male champion uh, for the advancement of women. Uh, thank you in the name of, of, of all of us. Uh, it's uh, time for us to open up to the Q&A period. Uh, I'd like to invite Sunita Mahan to Director of Legal Affairs at Ivano Cambridge. 
Um, hello, Sunita. Hello. Uh, who has been mentioned also co-chairs our uh, Chimano Committee, of which Jennifer Bishop is also a member of uh, now. Um, Sunita, maybe before you start diving into the questions, do you have any comments since you are not in a law firm? You're an in-house uh, counsel, I guess, uh, is how you call it. Uh, do you have any comments about how to advance uh, parity in your world? Um, absolutely. So um, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, including me and thank you for uh, the very insightful and engaging conversation. I've been sitting here chomping at the bit because I have so many questions. But <laughs> we, we will get questions from the, from the audience. Um, I guess from my perspective, what I find fascinating overall is that the legal industry itself, we are trained, educated, skilled experts that are speaking or negotiating or representing on behalf of our clients or others who, who look to us as experts. So what I find fascinating is that we can go and negotiate a great deal. We can um, you know, settle a, a huge litigation. But yet in our own industry, mm. we're so behind for such a, an important cause. So I feel like the two just don't go together. And I guess, I Nick, to your point of, uh, you know, when you came back to the industry, you, you realized, okay, we haven't really moved the needle much. We're still at the same place. Um, but as in house counsel, I would say, absolutely, this is something that is top of mind. Um, for myself and for my fellow counsel internally. I know with our general counsel, we talk about these issues uh, regularly, more, more often late of late, but absolutely, when I'm looking to engage external counsel uh, to represent us on a file, when we're looking at the team, it's definitely a reflex. We look to see who is the representation and can you relate? Because you want to work with people that you can connect with, that understand who you are, understand your business needs. And I think what Jennifer said earlier is, is hugely important. I, you know, the point I think you said, uh, the example of, oh, shoot, we didn't realize the whole in-house counsel team is a, a group of females. Um, so that kind of leads me to the first question, I guess, is what are the measures in place today uh, at your respective firms or maybe firms that you're aware of where we are trying to, um, you know, advance this change. Have you looked at your internal policies? Are you trying to flip the script? Like, what are you doing actively that's tangible that ensures that the mandate for a client is uh, fairly represented? Anybody can answer. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to start if, if, if you want, Sunita. And, and one of the things that uh, unfortunately has gotten a little bit delayed, I would say, as a result of, of COVID, but uh, we certainly look to get this back on track. It's something I referred to sort of earlier on in the conversation about our uh, analysis of work allocation and you know who in the client groups and client teams uh, is getting the work, exactly what kind of work uh, different people are doing to make sure that they're a, that people get a fair shot at getting good quality work and having exposure to good quality client relationships. Uh, and, and that means literally uh, looking at our top clients, uh, having the uh, finance department you know, give us a printout of the number of hours put by each person, having somebody analyze, well, what exactly did you know, lawyers A, B, and C do? And uh, you know, having a discussion with the... Uh, client mm -hmm. team to make sure that there is that uh, or hoping that there is a fair work allocation and if there isn't uh, trying to enforce it uh, going forward I'll tell you one of the most effective things uh, that we've seen over the past few years is a handful of clients including uh, Sunita your, your uh, I guess parent company sending I guess all their external law firms letters as doing an audit uh, I guess it's a gender audit essentially asking mm -hmm who has worked on our files, uh, give us the, uh, essentially not names or anything, but a, a gender, a gender profile uh, based on years of bar and number of hours work. And when we as an external law firm get that kind of message from our major clients, 
um, you know, that's a real reality check saying, you know, this really is important to our clients. It is something we need to think about. It's not just a nice to have or, uh, uh, you know, let's, let's, let's be uh, uh, better than the next firm, but it's something that clients are actually looking, looking at. And so for better or for worse, for some, uh, for some practitioners, uh, seeing that this is something really important to the client is what drives the, uh, the behavior. Uh, this obviously only makes sense, you know, with larger clients, larger relationships, et cetera. But uh, it's that kind of thing that certainly uh, makes a difference. Thank you. Oh, the power of the purse. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, obviously uh, being qualified is very important. I will, uh, actually, there's a question that, that is kind of connected to what you just talked about and being qualified and having the right team as well. Um, so here's a question from our audience. Uh, companies are increasingly relying on AI in the hiring process, but are they doing enough to avoid that machines and or algorithms reproduce human biases, whether conscious or unconscious? So um, I don't know if the firms are using any of these uh, AI tools, but can you share your perspective on this? I have to say, we're not there yet. I wish, but uh, we're not there yet. So no, we're not, we're actually not using any AI tool in that context. Uh, but, you know, obviously there, there's a whole discussion in, in the scientific world in terms of, you know, to what extent are human biased are, are being uh, transmitted, uh, you know, in, in, a, in, in our technology. Uh, but would be difficult for me to, to give uh, a relevant answer to that very interesting question this said. Yeah, we need to, I guess it's maybe the technology will come secondary. We just need to get parity first. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another question from, uh, from our audience, what are you doing outside of your organizations to influence the next generation of talent so that your organizations are seen as a viable career path for diverse women? I love that question. Uh, uh, I'll go first. Uh, for me, it's it's uh, always been extremely important uh, to uh, you know to to be involved in the community, um, to give back, uh, and 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 that for me is such a great way to to network, but also to be more creative. Uh, and to be able to nourish yourself with with different business models, with different ways of thinking, uh, and uh, you know, from our firm perspective, uh, I would say that you know we encourage people who want to be involved in different causes and at all kinds of levels. I mean, we don't even have a filter in terms of what you should be doing. I mean, you know, I think you should carry your passions in life and and hopefully people are passionate not just about the practice of law but as, as well as are passionate about other things uh, so I, I think there's a lot tremendous benefits uh, in in terms of uh, uh, being involved maybe on uh, on boards on associations uh, or even from a legal perspective uh, you know in, in different legal associations Personally, I mentor a lot, um, and and for me, it's it's a it's a passion, but it's also a way of of understanding what's going on in, in other industries, uh, you know, and, and enlarging my perception uh, and and my awareness of uh, of the good things or the less good things that are happening happening elsewhere, and actually uh, benefiting from from the different lessons uh, than that you know than people I'm mentoring can can also teach me. Uh, so I, I think it's essential. Jennifer, did you want to add anything? I know you're very active um, within the, the, the tennis world. Um, are there any learnings or anything that you're doing there that kind of translates into uh, the legal industry? Well, um, you know, I would, well, a couple things. First of all, um, uh, one of the things that I have personally done is I have created um, a woman's network in my world. So, you know, in the office, I have a list of women across the country, their areas of expertise, their hourly rates, 
Um, our students that come in, I try to reach out to the women. I actually had one of our students that's probably on the line here today, gave her the opportunity to research some of these topics, to talk to me about it so she can start building her growth in that area. Um, but also in my personal life, my, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, we talk about opportunities for women in the legal industry, but, um, you know, my, my accountant is a woman, my doctor's a woman, uh, my contractor's a woman, the person that paints my house is a woman. I go out of my way to try and uh, give opportunities to women in my personal life as well, female-owned businesses. Um, and I would say in the sports world, um, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do, but I will say that I'm so pleased that across um, a number of national sporting organizations in Canada, we are really making an effort to move the needle. Um, globally, we're well behind. Um, uh, uh, you know, in terms of gender equity and leadership positions and sporting organizations. But in Canada, there is a very, very strong awareness. And I'm, I'm proud to say that Tennis Canada actually committed to quotas um, on it. <laughs> Perhaps I might have caused them to commit to quotas um, uh, at, at the board level, at the senior management level. Um, and I, I am really encouraged by that. And so we're actively looking to find a minimum of 30% women within the next two years and then 50% within the next five and same at the senior management team level. So conversations are happening. And as you know, Sunita, um, you know, looking to build on that with other national sporting organizations in the country to learn what they're doing and to perhaps try and help push their gender equity agendas as well. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump. We, we are getting a lot of activity, so this is really great. I think I could go on for hours on this topic. Um, here's another question. Yeah, four from, minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> what, is your, uh, what is your experience? Sorry, excuse me. What are we doing to prevent that only white women benefit from all gender parity efforts? How are we treating women of color? I mean, if you want, I can maybe just kick off on that because that is a very important uh, question and uh, and very important uh, for us in the in the community to to acknowledge. Uh, there have been a number of different uh, initiatives, uh, and I would say most of these have, at least from what I've been able to see, uh, arisen in the past uh, couple of years. Uh, I'm sensitive that time is a bit tight, but uh, certainly with the, uh, at least in Quebec, with the Quebec Bar, the Bavo du Quebec, there have been a number of initiatives that uh, all the firms, including Anique's firm and my firm and Jennifer's firm, have been involved in to, uh, uh, to see how we can encourage from the ground up, from the uh, high schools to the CJAPs in Quebec to the universities, to in, try to, uh, to, to encourage um, uh, women and men, quite frankly, from a more diverse background from coming into the legal uh, profession, because that's where it starts. Uh, there are definitely far, far too few uh, uh, women and, frankly, men of color, uh, at least in, uh, in Montreal and Quebec, in the legal uh, profession. And it's uh, definitely something that's top of mind uh, at, I would say, all the leading law firms, as well as at the uh, Quebec Bar. And do you find that, and I don't know if your firms use executive uh, search recruitment firms, but how do you find uh, the recruiting firms and are they, you know, the recruiters themselves, how, how is their support in finding diverse talent? Um, and, you know, it kind of, it starts somewhere in the sense of the search to try to keep the needle moving. So how is your experience with uh, recruitment firms? I mean, I can, I can maybe just speak very quickly from, uh, I guess, personal experience in Montreal. Uh, and this is perhaps very much of a, uh, more of a local experience. Uh, so the, the, the pool is relatively, uh, uh, I would say, I guess, limited in a way in Montreal. Uh, so that's why I was focusing more on the growth through the, uh, the universities and uh, more organic growth in the law firms. But certainly the, the, uh, executive search and recruitment firms uh, are uh, as helpful as they can be uh, in terms of finding uh, and allowing us to develop our, our talent. The experience might be different in Toronto. I don't know, Jennifer, if you have any uh, views on that or any in your national experience. Yeah, I agree. I think the pool um, well, for women is certainly small and for women of color is even smaller. So 
I know our firm has uh, very much focused on the organic growth. And, uh, you know, we've been very pleased with our numbers and our results and the energy that's being created. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, there was a, I think it was in the Globe and Mail where the law firms came out with women of color, uh, lawyers of color. Um, and, uh, you know, Miller Thompson uh, did relatively well, uh, but again, it's all relative. I think it starts again with how many uh, women of color are going to law school, then how many women of color are being given opportunities to article at law firms and then receiving the tap on the shoulder to move their way up the ladder. So we are critically looking at that, but from a lateral recruitment standpoint, it really is a challenge. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's such an important question. I agree, Sunita. And uh, actually in 2019, uh, at Women in Governance, as we were working on the new parity certification for 2020, we always look at updating and, and, and keeping current. Uh, and we've added an intersectionality uh, section to the questionnaire where we do ask about women of uh, various origins, uh, indigenous, black, LGBTQ, etc., because we do recognize that they are facing added obstacles relative to, to white women. So this is all the time that we have. It's one o'clock. I made it a point to always finish on time. So I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. So Annie Trudel of Lavry, Solomon Sanis of Norton Rose, Jennifer Bishop of Miller Thompson, Sunita Mahant of Ivano Cambridge. It was wonderful spending this time with you. I hope that everyone in the audience uh, enjoyed our, our time together. And uh, if you've got any additional questions, please send us emails. And uh, if you I would like us to uh, relay some of your questions to the panelists. Please feel free to do so. Also, if not already done, register to womenandgovernance.org newsletter, and uh, you'll be informed of all our events, uh, the Global Leaders for Parity events that take place uh, approximately every couple of weeks. Mentoring program, very important. We've mentioned it. Anybody interested to become a mentee or a mentor? And um, of course, parity certification. We have broken records of organizations that have enrolled over the past two months. It's, it's unbelievable and very refreshing to see so many organizations understanding the value despite the pandemic and despite other difficulties that they may be facing. So uh, we will leave you with one slide of the 48 organizations that uh, uh, were parity certified last year. And know that we're, I think, at 62 already for 2020. And there's a few more months to go. So we keep at it. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for your enthusiasm and your engagement towards parity. Goodbye. Thank you, Caroline. Bye. Thank you. Merci.